Thank you. Unthinking respect for authority is the greatest enemy of truth. It's a quote that uh, I think of often. My first 20 episodes of my podcast, I started with this quote. I um, thought it was really profound, uh, a lot of what Rodrigo spoke about. Uh, you can take the quote, obviously, a couple of different ways. Obviously, there's context to consider. However, let's just take it at pure face value. Who wouldn't agree with this sentiment? Uh, misplaced trust in anything could be a recipe for disaster, and I think we can all agree on that. So who said unthinking respect for authority is the greatest enemy of truth? Albert Einstein. Which I find extremely ironic, as we'll touch on a bit later. Um, so my presentation here this morning is going to, uh, the, the plan is I'm going to skim, just kind of skim the surface of seven topics that are, I feel, persistent in the overall conversation when it comes to this discussion of the shape of the world, um, and used often by defenders of a globular Earth, often as appeals to authority, unthinking respect for the perceived authority, that is. So this is not meant to be an exhaustive uh, analysis on each topic uh, whatsoever, but simply to give you a taste of what many on the globular Earth side of the conversation attempt to use as so-called proofs of a globular Earth, and why I think those arguments don't hold water. So this presentation, again, not intended to be evidence for and certainly not proof of the flat Earth, but more of a high-level analysis of alleged globe Earth proofs. What I found they are actually based on and why I think they are pointless for anyone to try and defend a globular Earth theory. Hence why I call them gobbledygook. I'm not sure if it's a term that is used on this side of the Atlantic Ocean, but I use it often in the States when I refer to gibberish. And I think it, the origin is referring to the sound a turkey makes. So before we dive into these seven topics, um, I, I, I kind of felt compelled in any situation like this to uh, make a few requests based on my experience in seeing how the media handles um, these sort of gatherings or these sort of events. So if you're seated in this, uh, in this auditorium, uh, and you're a journalist and you're covering this event. I'm not sure there are any in, the, in here or not. But first off, we would appreciate if you would not make uh, any reference to or even mention the Flat Earth Society. Uh, personally, I'm not associated with this group, and I do not believe anyone um, here is either. When we see articles covering events such as this, the Flat Earth Society is often mentioned, and it just reveals how lazy the journalism was, as Rodrigo mentioned. Um, somebody simply Googled Flat Earth and uh, looked at the few links at the top of their search en engine results, and uh, this is what they come up with. So we believe the Flat Earth Society is controlled opposition. If you don't know what that means, look that up. I think they mix a little bit of truth in with a portion of outlandish claims, so that at first glance, you're compelled to dismiss the entire idea quickly, all the while thinking you've actually done some research. Trust me, you haven't. We know that if you spend time actually researching this topic, you'll be sucked in. So the idea is that you Google Flat Earth, end up on the Flat Earth Society page, and see something that you will laugh and move on quickly. Secondly, there's no one here that believes that we live on a pancake or a pizza floating in space, so please do not include these sort of images in your article because it's disingenuous and does not represent our findings or beliefs in the least. Next, no one here believes the Earth is moving upward at 9.8 meters per second squared, which causes us to experience something akin to gravity. We do not believe the Earth is moving in any way, shape, or form, period, paragraph. And finally, please stop asking, where's the edge? We believe the, um, we believe the world's oceans are surrounded by Antarctica, which is like the shoreline of a lake. So when I get that question, I usually uh, respond, can you fall off a lake? So please do not, of course you can, so please stop asking if you can fall off the earth. And do yourself and all of us a favor and research the Antarctic Treaty. Um, you'll begin to understand why we all aren't piling in a boat this weekend and heading to Antarctica to see what uh, lies beyond. We aren't able to travel independently below the 60th parallel and must not only have our own government's permission, but all of the permission of the governments that have land claims in Antarctica. There are no motorized vehicles allowed, no sled dogs, and you have to bag your own urine and feces. The Antarctic Treaty alone should cause you to question the motives of the world's governments if you dare to look into it. 
And one final point, while I'm on the subject of Antarctica, no, we are not planning a cruise there next year. Uh, if you Google Flat Earth Cruise, you still come up with hundreds of headlines making that claim, and that was never the plan. One media outlet got it flat out wrong, and hundreds of other media outlets simply copied that story and didn't practice any due diligence and just ran with it. All that being said, uh, if you are a journalist uh, attending this convention, first of all, thank you for being here. We hope you represent the organizers, the speakers, and attendees respectfully, and most importantly, we hope you represent them accurately. My rant is over. All right, let's get going. As I mentioned previously, going to touch on seven topics that are persistent in the Flat Earth versus Globe Earth conversation used by defenders of the globular Earth with unthinking respect for authority. And here they are. Number one, the Earth is a pair. Number two, radius, or R, of the Earth. Distance to the sun, the shrinking sun, uh, Coriolis effect, gravity, and gas pressure. All right, number one. When it comes to the shape of our world, the idea that the Earth is not being a perfect sphere comes up often. Officially, we are told the Earth is an oblate spheroid, uh, meaning it is a bit wider than it is taller, somewhere between 13 and 20 miles wider than it is taller, in fact. Therefore, difficult to tell by distant observation of the Earth's oblateness. Satellites, we're told, have to be about 22,000 miles away in order to see the entire disk at one time. Then we're faced with claims such as this uh, meme, which suggests that if you take the highest resolution pictures that we get of the Earth, 121 megapixel files, 40 megabytes, from the Japanese weather satellite, the Himawari, and measure down to the individual pixel count and compare the width and height uh, of the Earth, that it measures wider than it is taller, supporting the notion that the Earth is not a perfect sphere, but an oblate spheroid. There are 121 megapixels, excuse me, 121 million pixels in these images. Uh, so I want to give thanks to researcher, uh, moon researcher Dave Marsh, maybe you're familiar with him. He uses the same technique with special commercial software to measure uh, the angular size of the moon using pixel width. And we verified that this meme is in fact correct in its measurements of the image of the Earth. And it seems to support the notion that the difference in the width and height of the disk is about 0.3% which aligns with the WGS-84 model of the Earth, so somewhere around 13 to 20 miles wider than it is taller. So point for the globe, right? Well, not so fast. The problem is that the absolute widest point of the high, highest resolution images that we get are precisely the same number of pixels from the top of the image that it is to the bottom, meaning the absolute widest point of the Earth in these 120 uh, million uh, pixels is exactly midway between the North and South Poles directly on the equator. Let me restate that differently just to make sure you're getting this. The same measurements used to prove the Earth's oblateness uh, confirm that the Earth's absolute widest point is straight through the center of the circle or the equator. Do you guys see a problem with this? Let me play a short clip. Hopefully this will jog your memory. So, so you spin, you know, when you spin pizza dough, it kind of flattens out. Yeah. It gets wider in the middle. And so Earth throughout its life, even when it formed, it was spinning, and it got a little wider at the equator than it does at the poles. So it's not actually a sphere, it's, an, it's oblate, and officially it's an oblate spheroid, that's what we call it. But not only that, it's slightly wider below the equator than above the equator, where it's like pear-shaped. Yeah. So it turns out the pear-shapedness is bigger than the height of Mount Everest above sea level. Not only that, it's slightly wider below the equator than above the equator. Um, so this is Neil deGrasse Tyson talking about the, how the Earth is actually wider below the equator than it is above. That's what he states. And that's where he comes up with his pear shapedness, is what he calls it, OK? So it's slightly wider below the equator than it is above the equator which is where his pear shapedness comes from. So those high resolution images of the Earth, which we are told are photographs of our world from 22,000 miles away, can be used to verify that the Earth is oblate. But they essentially debunk, then, the world's most famous and well-known astrophysicist, Neil deGrasse Tyson, looked at um, as one of the foremost authorities on our universe by the general public, who says the Earth is wider below the, below the equator than it is above. So let's talk about the world-renowned astrophysicist for a moment. To be fair, Neil is also known for his award-winning acting. Here's a list of his accomplishments from the Internet Movie Database. Uh, did you know he's been nominated for Emmys and Grammys? 
and even was a Critics' Choice Television Award winner. We'll be picking on Neil uh, quite, a bit, um, quite a bit more this morning, so stay tuned for that. On a side note, regarding the Himawari images, um, they aren't really photographs anyway. As I've demonstrated previously in my Faking Space video series, uh, in case you've not seen it, fakingspace.net, they are available free to stream or download directly from the website. What we found is that the weather patterns we see in the Himawari images are from combined local Doppler and um, local Doppler radar feeds and over land and uh, climate simulation weather patterns over the ocean. And software is used to wrap it around the Blue Marble Dataset 2.0 from NASA illustrator Robert Simmon back in 2002. So it states right on the FTP file server, the Himawari images, that the underlying land in the images is from the Blue Marble data set from 2002. Further, anyone can do a quick forensic analysis of any of the images uh, that were given every 10 minutes from the Himawari and see that they contain no noise and no ambient light, which absolutely must be present if these are real photographs. And then finally, speaking of Dave Marsh again, I wanted to mention this, if you haven't, had a chance to see what he presented in the U, uh, at the UK conference two weeks ago, which I thought was fascinating. Um, he's calculating the angular size of the moon using the same software that he did for the Himawari for me. And he's done this uh, nearly a dozen times now. And uh, these are a handful of the photos that he's captured with his Nikon P1000, all consistently capturing uh, the moon with a 2,000 millimeter focal length. And what Dave is observing is that over and over again that the moon always measures smaller on the horizon than it does at its zenith. Uh, and as it heads away from the observer, it gets smaller and smaller. This is extremely strong evidence that the moon is smaller and closer than what we've been taught. So great work, Dave. So the world's most recognized astrophysicist, the Himawari, and the mainstream moon narrative all debunked in the same section. We're off to a good start. All right, we're going to move on to the radius or R of the Earth. The letter of the day, boys and girls, is the letter R. You may remember that from Sesame Street. Whether the Earth is a sphere or an oblate spheroid, it must have curvature. All uh, Earth curve calculators used to indicate the hidden height of an object below the Earth's alleged curvature at given distances based on the observer's height, obviously, um, and the elevation of the object that's being observed. All require one essential piece of data in order to calculate the final result using geometry, and that is the radius of the Earth, or the R value. The R value is from the assumed center point of the globe, a location that no one has been to or can get to, it appears. The deepest hole ever dug into the Earth was approximately eight miles. And that's about 3,950 miles short of where the alleged center of the Earth is. So the radius of the Earth has never been verified. Further, as we just established quite thoroughly, we're told the Earth isn't a perfect sphere anyway, it's oblate. This is a key point to understand because if that were true, then the radius of the Earth would be unique for each observer and unique to the object that is being observed. There would not be one firm value of R for every observation. If the Earth is oblate, then there is no single value of R, therefore no set curvature, and otherwise an arbitrary or useless number. Now this becomes a big problem when you need an R value for, thing like, um, for things like Earth curve calculators. The most notorious, if you're not aware, most of you probably are, um, is the curve calculator by, created by Mick West on his metabunk.org website, which is favorited by proponents of a globular Earth. Last year, Mick West was taken to task by Nathan Oakley and Anthony Riley uh, about this specific issue. I hope we've got the audio sorted here. The R value used in, this, uh, in his very popular Earth curve calculator and the audio that was captured by the YouTube live stream was absolutely priceless, so let's see if we can give it a listen. Is that, is, do, you, do you still maintain that position? Well, uh, it's the standard model. Of the Sorry, model. the standard model has no scientific backing. It is an assumption, correct? Well, it's the standard model. Sorry, the standard model has no scientific evidence. You only assume a value of R. Correct, Mick? For crying out loud, man. Yeah. Yeah. So I wish they had the, like a video, you know, it would have been classic. We just got the audio, but it was classic. Um, so yeah, he admits it. The radius of Earth is only an assumption. And uh, make sure we're on the right slide. Over the years, there have been many different um, assumptive values for the size of the Earth, varying country by country, all with different assumptions of R. And if one models R 
value, let's say, is 1,500 meters, even 1,500 meters more than the other, this would put the observer height you know, higher or lower and manipulates the alleged curve between the two points. So you know, in, if each country's model comes up with a different assumptive value of r, there is no true r, you know, one r value for the globe and the calculations der derived from. And r is not only used for uh, curve calculations, but also orbital distances of satellites from ground level. Uh, but as we'll see in a bit, it's used for calculating some very important distances within our solar system. But back quickly to Mick West, uh, this is the same guy who called out Neil deGrasse Tyson, in fact, about how high you have to be to see the Earth's curvature. Did you guys see this? Not only that, they made sure to photograph him standing there with a really wide angle lens, which curves horizontal lines. Right. So in the photo, you see this curvature of Earth's surface, and he said, wow, he's in space. Look at that. No, he's not. At that height, you don't see, you don't see the curvature of the Earth if you are two millimeters above this beach ball. <laughs> it is, he just don't. <laughs> that stuff is flat. That's some pretty high production value, you know, all that stuff. Like Rodrigo was talking about, I mean, this is the world's stage, and, and this is, you know, high, you know the, the emotion that you get from watching him jump, you know, I mean, it's powerful stuff. But then you go on metabug.org, you know, Mick West website, and he calls out Neil and says, you know, we can observe curvature as low as 45,000 feet. So he, he flat out says the world's leading, you know, astrophysicist is, is flat out wrong. You know, I, I mean, I find the, the doublespeak here, you know, nothing reconciles. You know, if this were all true, it would all reconcile. Um, but, you know, obviously we've got to mention that um, there are many videos online, if I'm sure many of people have seen that, of high altitude balloon footage in excess of, you know, way above 100,000 feet, um, showing no curve, as long as you're using a rectilinear lens, which produces little to no barrel distortion or the so-called fish eye effect. So I have to say, Neil, we're probably with you on this one. Um, unthinking respect for authority again, is the greatest enemy of truth. So let's move on to number three, the distance to the sun. And uh, we had a little bit of a delay, so I'm, I'm gonna be, I'm running late here. Um, for those of you who heard my story, I started my truth journey uh, investigating the images of the Earth from space, uh, which led me to the production of my Fake in Space video series, where I offer a forensic analysis of the images um, and show the anomalies, the lack of continuity, again, lack of reconciliation, chicanery, in other words, of the World Space Agency is trying to pass off CGI as real photographs. But after going down that rabbit hole, so to speak, I dived more into space topics such as the distance to the stars, how that's derived, uh, other planets, and our sun. And what I found was when it came to these most important topics, essential, essential to modeling our world, our solar system, the galaxy, you know, the universe, et cetera, it was all assumptive based. So the bottom line for me was, you know, so-called scientists who, you know, worked out how this all works appear to use a logical fallacy called circular reasoning. And that's how they make all the math to work out. When the math works out, then it must be true, right? I mean, that's what we're told. Uh, and that's the deception. This method um, became really obvious to me when I looked into how they calculated the distance from the Earth to the sun. First off, the distance to the sun has been calculated 
uh, to be quite different over the centuries, showing that the uh, so-called scientific community had to keep working on the assumptions that they were making and working out the math to make sure that it all lined up. NASA's astronomical figures sound perfectly precise, but uh, heliocentrists have historically been notorious for regularly and drastically changing the numbers to suit their various models. For instance, in his time, Nicholas Copernicus calculated the sun's distance uh, to be about 3.3 million miles away. The next century, Johannes Kepler decided it was about 12.3 million. Um, Isaac Newton was once quoted as saying, it matters not whether we reckon it 28 or 54 million miles, for either would do just as well. That's pretty scientific. Benjamin Martin calculated between 81 and 82 million. Uh, Thomas Dilworth, 93.7. John Hind, 95.2, positively 95.2. And Benjamin Gould said uh, more than 96 million. And then the, the, the one that looked like the most was Christian Meyer. He said that's uh, about 104 million. Quoting from Thomas Winship's book, uh, Zetetic Cosmology, uh, Cos Cosmogony, if I can say that, 1899. As the sun, according to science, may be anything from three to 104 million miles away, there is plenty of space to choose from. It is like the showman and the child. You pay your money for various astronomical works and you take your choice as to what distance you wish the sun to be. And if you're a modest person, you just go in for a few million. Um, but if you wish to be very scientific uh, and be mathematically certain of your figures, then I advise you to make your choice somewhere around 100 million. You will at least have plenty of space to retreat into should the next uh, calculation be against you, the figures of your choice. You can always add a few million you know, here and there to keep up with the times or take off as many as you uh, may be required to adjust the distance to the very latest accurate column of figures. Talk about ridicule. The whole of modern astronomy is like a farcical comedy full of surprises. One never knows what monstrous or ludicrous absurdity may come forth next. You must not apply the ordinary rules of common sense to astronomical guesswork. No, the thing would absolutely fall to pieces if you did. So in a nutshell, this is how they calculate the distance from the Earth to the Sun. Scientists observed Venus transiting the Sun. Now the transits of Venus are very, very rare. Um, they occur in a pattern that repeats every 243 years, with pairs of transits eight years apart, separated by gaps of 121 and 105 years. So on average, about every 113 years. The next one, coincidentally, will be in the year 2117. So they determined the distance from Venus to the Sun by using the speed and the size of Venus's orbit around the Sun. Okay? They assumed Venus and the Earth to be of the same size. That was the first assumption they made. And then they were able to determine the distance of Venus to the Sun by determining the speed and size of Venus's orbit around the Sun. Does that compute? Because that's the circular reference again. So then they used that data to determine that Venus's distance to the Sun was about three-fourths of the distance of the Earth to the Sun because of the size of the Sun. But they calculated the size of the Sun based on the distance of the Earth to the Sun. Circular references abound. And the underlying data that they used to base all these calculations was an assumption that the Earth is an oblate spheroid with a circumference based on their absolute 100% ironclad, measured and validated radius of the Earth. I recommend checking out Gerard Hickson's 1922 book, Kings Dethroned, if you have not read it, in which he breaks down methodically and irrefutably, in my opinion, how many assumptions were made in coming up with these astronomical distances between celestial bodies. If even one of these assumptions are slightly off, the entire model is going to be wrong. They cite Johannes Kepler's third law of orbital mechanics often. Uh, Kepler, who said that the Earth was, or the Sun was 12 million miles away. But here's the kicker and where the deception is. You need to know either the size of the object or the distance to that object to figure out the other figure using geometry. But they calculate one using the other. It's a circ completely a circular reference. No actual measurements have been or ever will be taken to validate either one. Quote, today's scientists have substituted mathematics for experiments, and they wander off through equation after equation and eventually build a structure which has no relation to reality. I think Nicholas, or Nikola Tesla said it best. Now, I don't know if you guys saw this, the sun might actually be bigger than we originally thought. What does that do to all the math um, you know, that we've been given, that we're told proves the cosmos? 
What you'll find as you dig in is that the universe is an assumptive-based model built on a mathematical construct that only works because of logical fallacies such as circular reasoning. There is no verification of any of the assumptions that are made, only explanations built to make up the pieces of the puzzle. And these assumptive figures that are worked out mathematically are taught to the world as fact. There is no true science behind any of it whatsoever. Again, the unthinking respect for authority is the greatest enemy of truth. All right, number four, I'm gonna try and move quickly through these. The shrinking sun. The staunch defenders of the globe think they are having a field day with those of us that do not accept the claim that our sun is 93 million miles away because they state that we don't see this, this, uh, the sun change in angular size over the course of the day and therefore it cannot be small and close. It must be huge and far away. Well, that argument that the sun's size does not change, therefore it's massive and far away, is an informal fallacy called a straw man. It is based on an assumption that the sun is a physical object with an actual and verifiable position, which obviously we just covered in point number three. The de globe defender belief is that the sun is 93 million miles away. Light travels 186,000 miles per second. Therefore, the light we are receiving from the sun originated from the sun eight minutes ago. We're not seeing the actual sun in the sky. We're seeing an apparent sun. This is also the argument they use to explain sunsets, that the apparent sun is seen by us as setting, but the real sun is already below the horizon due to the distance of the sun and because of atmospheric refraction. So if we follow the logic, we're seeing an apparent, not actual sun, uh, location of the sun. We can only measure the angular size of the sun from our location here on Earth. And that angular size would only be apparent, again, not actual, to the individual observer at their own unique location, and the horizon is also an apparent not actual location too. So I think it bears repeating that the horizon is not an actual, uh, it's not an actual location. It's an apparent location where the sky meets and touches the land or water. So the horizon is different to each observer. The height of the observer and weather conditions obviously vary and we have a very, uh, we have an apparent horizon. The horizon is not an actual location. Anyone can go, but defenders of the glow reify the horizon to be the solid leading edge of a spherical earth claiming that celestial objects going beyond that location are below your observer location, i.e. the sun. So in summary, if we can keep all of their arguments in line, the Globe Defender's argument would actually be broken down as, or their question would be, why don't we see the apparent size of the apparent sun change when looking at the apparent position of the sun disappearing at an apparent location of the horizon? <laughs> I think you, everybody sees how silly that would be. Science will need to provide, first of all, evidence that the sun is a physical object at the distance that they say it is and the size that they claim it is. And as we've discussed already, this has not happened and will not happen. Shifting gears to the moon real quickly. Attempts to measure the distance of the uh, Earth to the moon are common amongst the defenders of the globe as well. They use an assumed curved Earth, of course, based on the assumptive arm value to calculate their angles using two different locations and solving for the leading edge of a triangle using geometry. They have to use a known size of the moon to do so. What mainstream science maintains to be about 2,000 miles in diameter, and they come up with 238,000 miles of distance. However, let's give them all that and assume that all that is true, then the same must hold true for the distance of the Earth to the sun, because the sun and the moon are identical size. So you would have to deduce that the sun is the same distance as the moon. It's only when the assumed size of the sun is added to the calculation. 864,000 miles is what we're told, so the math cranks out 93 million miles. But as I've already covered, they came up with the size of the sun based on the distance to the sun using circular reasoning. No wonder the math always works. Just remember this, you need the distance to get the size or you need the size to get the distance. They have neither, so they use circular reasoning to build a mathematical construct. I'm thinking respect for authority will always be the greatest enemy of truth. All right, we're gonna move on to number five, Coriolis effect. We're told that the Earth spins on its axis approximately every 24 hours. This is why we have day and night, right? Well, we can model the day and night on a flat model of the Earth. So what else is there? Well, the defender of the globe will say, you idiot, you didn't, didn't you go to school? Uh, you must have flunked science and um, you forgot about the Coriolis effect, which proves that the Earth is spinning. The Coriolis effect describes the pattern of deflection, here's the definition, taken by objects not firmly connected to the ground as they travel long distance around and above the Earth. The Coriolis effect is responsible for many large-scale weather patterns. It's also why Foucault's pendulum does this, we're told. 
The pendulum is set in motion very carefully to avoid introducing any sideways motion, usually by tying it back with a thread of cotton and slowly burning the end of it with a candle. Oddly, it will then appear to change its direction and swing over time without any outside input. Of course, it's actually with the earth that is spinning or rotating underneath the pendulum, which is why it continues to swing in the same plane relative to the rest of the universe. So that's how it works. So let's dive into this effect called Coriolis, which allegedly is evidence that the Earth is spinning on its axis. For there to be a Coriolis effect, you must have two reference frames, the Earth, a non-inertial uh, non rotating reference, and then the air or anything not attached to the Earth, an inertial, an inertial excuse me, non-rotating reference. So the Coriolis effect can be demonstrated, as you can see here, by throwing a ball while on a rotating roundabout or merry-go-round, etc. The person sitting on the rotating frame of reference is attached to the first reference frame, which is spinning. When, they, when the person throws the ball, the ball travels in a straight line, leaving the first reference frame and going into the second reference frame, which is the non-inertial reference frame. Although the ball is moving in a straight line, it appears to deflect or curve in relation to the observer, who is in the first frame of reference. Now, the following... Uh, are example observations that we are told are caused by the spin of the Earth and otherwise prove to us that the Earth is spinning. Foucault's pendulum, hurricanes, typhoons, uh, toilet water, I've been told, you know, because it goes this way you know, in parts of the world and then it goes this way in the other parts of the world. And then footballs are also affected by Coriolis. Are Why you don't you talk about that? my other football tweet? What other about the, was it the Bengals? Some I forgot who it was about a year ago. Yeah. There's in overtime, after there was the exchange of ball, so now it's sudden death overtime. They kick a field goal from 50 yards, of course, mm -hmm. as it must be, and well, 40 yards out plus the 10 plus the hike and distance. So it was like 52 yard field goal, and there it was. And if there's tense, right? Everybody's silent, and the ball comes up, and it careens off the left upright mm. and goes in. Mm. For the win. Wow. And I said, hmm. I remember this. That's what I'm saying. I remember this That's tweet. That's what I'm saying. So I'm there and I said, hmm, wait, wait, the angle of this, how long is it? So I checked the stadium on its configuration, what's longitude and latitude, and I said, I did a quick calculation, and I tweeted, the winning field goal in that game was aided by a one third of an inch deflection to the right from Earth's rotation. That is the nerdiest <laughs> tweet I've ever heard in my life. So it's good to know that kick footballs are susceptible to the Earth's spin, but airplanes, helicopters, drones, hot air balloons are not. If the Coriolis effect with respect to the Earth is real, take, for example, a commercial flight from Charlotte, North Carolina, to Los Angeles, California. They both sit about 35 degrees north latitude where the Earth is allegedly spinning at 860 miles per hour. When the plane takes off and travels 500 miles per hour to the west, plus you add in the rotation of the Earth coming towards the plane at 860 miles an hour, that's about 1,360 miles per hour that the plane would be covering. It would be a very significant amount of ground in a very short period of time. The flight would be something like 90 minutes to cover that distance. But in reality, the flight takes approximately four hours. And the flight time is generally the same in both directions where the plane would have to fly considerably faster east than it would to the west because Charlotte is traveling 860 miles per hour away from the plane once it left the ground in LA. And it left the first frame of reference and entered the second frame. In actuality, the only reason there's a slight difference in flight time is because generally planes flying west are headed into the wind and have tailwinds when they're heading east. So their average speeds in each direction will vary. And then what about planes heading north to south and vice versa? Think about that one for a while. The only way similar flight times in all geographic directions are possible on a spinning globe as if the atmosphere is stuck to the rotating globe, which is what we are taught, exactly that. But this asserts that there's only one reference frame, not the two reference frames that are absolutely vital for Coriolis to even be considered. So mainstream science's own admission is that there is no Earth-based Coriolis possible. When you Google, why can't I feel the Earth you know, spinning, you know, why can't I feel it you know, chasing the sun and, and, and orbiting around the sun, you get this explanation. The atmosphere is stuck to the Earth. How convenient. 
So when it comes to pendulums, hurricanes, typho uh, typhoons, uh, toilet water, and uh, kicked footballs, the Corliss effect is there to explain certain phenomena as proofs of the Earth is spinning, but generally it does not affect things like you know, missiles, bullets, uh, airplanes. It does warrant pointing out, obviously, that snipers, long-range missile operators, and the like reportedly do not account for the spin of the Earth, or curve for that matter. Uh, we have many, me uh, excuse me, ex-military personnel, long-range gunners, et cetera, who have stated plainly that there's only two dials on their scopes for one for elevation and one to adjust for the wind. There is no adjustment for latitude or direction, north, south, east, west, which would need to be factored in when determining the speed of the projectile and its relation to the Earth spinning underneath it when it left the gun and how long it was in the second frame of reference. Now, to hammer this point home, watch this demonstration of a gun fired straight up with the projectile in the air for almost two minutes, landing almost precisely where it was shot from. If the Corollis effect were a real thing and the Earth was spinning, then this bullet should have landed approximately 21 miles away. And this video was edited slightly for time constraints. Description the There he goes. Let me look at you for one minute. That's right, can you hear me? Yes. When it hits one minute and 20 seconds, let me know. Okay. One minute. So number six, and uh, I'm going to try and crank through these in five minutes. The number one proof of a globe that we are often presented with is obviously gravity, or the theory of. Apparently solves all the problems of the heliocentric model that those of us who question it bring to the table. Gravity is used to explain how trillions of gallons of ocean water can stay stuck to a spinning globe, how the air pressure system we enjoy here on Earth is kept from expanding into the ultra-low pressure of infinite and ever-expanding space, and at the same time keeps the Earth and the Moon chasing the Sun perfectly in a corkscrew pattern at almost half a million miles per hour. But like most beliefs in globular models of the Earth, there's not just one accepted explanation. So Isaac Newton is credited as being the father of gravity. He gave us the world's new, or excuse me, gave us the world's Newton's universal law of gravitation. Whereas he described that all mass attracts other mass and can be calculated using this famous formula that he's credited with, where big G is, is Newton's universal constant of gravity. But here's the interesting thing. Newton didn't even mention this universal constant of gravity, or G, in his famous 1687 publication, Principia Mathematica, in which he publishes his major work, including Newton's three laws. In fact, there was no formula or equation published in the Principia for the uh, universal law of gravitation. And as was the ways of the day, Newton described his newfound law using just words. And I quote, the principle of universal gravitation, namely that every particle of matter is attracted by or gravitates to every other particle of matter with a force inversely proportional to the squares of their distance. Again, quoting Newton himself. Newtonian gravity was said to be, and taught to, at least myself, as proven science. Most people today, when asked what gravity is, will explain to you that mass attracts mass. And the bigger the mass, the more the attractive force, as we'll see in this clip in a few moments. When we're told that this was proven science, it implies the empirical scientific method was used. So we apparently observe the natural phenomena of mass attracting mass. The cause of this observed effect, we are told, is due to the mass of the object, which leaves us with an hypothesis that would state, if mass, then mass attracts mass. And this is pseudoscience. Effects cannot be the cause in the scientific method. This is called, again, circular reasoning. But wait, globular Earth proponents have a lifeline for gravity. Newtonian gravity isn't the only accepted explanation for gravity anymore, where we are told it's not even an actual force. But you can think of it as a force. As George uh, Musser, contributing editor for Scientific American Magazine, said recently in an interview, he said, gravity isn't a force, but you can think of it as a force. And this is why I call it gobbledygook. 
Albert Einstein's theory is a concept only and can never be seen or measured. So Newton's law of gravitation is often interchanged with Einstein's when working out a physical force. You can work out the tra trajectory of throwing a ball and see it and test it with Newton's laws, but you can't with Einstein's. Without G, there is no physical force to be able to deal with. This asserts that even when something is at rest, like a cup on a table, it's still experiencing force. Einstein's theory of general relativity has emerged as the consensus of what gravity actually is, the bending of the conceptual medium of space-time, giving rise to a pseudo-force called gravity. So let's let, again, the world's most recognized astrophysicist enlighten us all. I'm telling you gravity really is the curvature of space and time. That gets us the Big Bang and everything we've ever the known and loved. space and time, but it's also based on mass, right? It's based on the amount of mass. Any and concentration mass. of matter and energy and or energy will curve the fabric of space and time. And the more and, mass, and, and, and the, the more movement gravity. of matter on that fabric of space and time, we call gravity. And I'm good with that. Okay, but you seem a little oddly defensive about something that's scientific. No, I have to say I'm good with the. But you, you, you are because you're kind of defending it. No, you can say, you're well, why does matter? Why do you need to know why? No, <laughs> why That's what does? You're no, I'm saying, why does matter and energy curve the fabric of space and time? You, you can ask that. Okay, why? And I, I don't have an answer for that. I can say. Well, that's all I'm asking. Newton was trying to describe the effect of gravity as a force we observe with a mathematical relationship in three dimensions: length, width, and height. Whereas Einstein superseded this with inventing the bending of a concept that can only exist in one's imagination, it manifests in three dimensions with the addition of the fourth imaginary dimension of time. The closest thing you'll find as far as demonstrations of Einstein's gravity is a trampoline with a bowling ball sitting on it, sagging in the middle. However, this is also demonstrating gravity as an actual force, and objects released on the trampoline obviously just sag straight to the bowling ball, and it's called science. But unfortunately, uh, you know, sorry, Newton and Einstein, um, you're soon to be replaced. Uh, there's a new kid on the block, black holes, which apparently are debunking both Newton and Einstein. And I know, don't worry, I mean, we used to think the sun was only three million miles away, so I mean, how foolish were we? Unthinking respect for authority is the greatest enemy of truth. All right, gonna do this in a minute. <laughs> We are told that the air pressure in outer space is immeasurable, right? Mainstream science maintains that there's two differing air pressure systems existing next to each other without a physical barrier. So at sea level, we measure about 14.7 pounds per square inch. But once you're far enough away from Earth, the pressure drops down to way less than one pound per square inch, way less, in fact. It's estimated to be one times 10 to the negative 17 torr. Basically, unmeasurable. Now, if we go to our college science textbooks to see how we define pressure, it says pressure is a force exerted by the substance per unit area on another substance. And here's the key line, which I've underlined. The pressure of a gas is the force that the gas exerts on the walls of its container. When you blow into a balloon, the balloon expands because the pressure of air molecules is greater on the inside of the balloon than on the outside. Pressure is a property which determines the direction in which mass flows. If the balloon is released, the air moves from a region of high pressure to a region of low pressure. Who better than a professor at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, or MIT, explain it simply for us? All right, let's try another pretty simple process. Let's just take a gas in some volume. V, and over here is going to be vacuum of equal volume, and we're going to remove the barrier. You know what's going to happen spontaneously, right? The gas is going to fill the available volume once, it's, once it becomes available, right? So once the volume becomes available, the gas fills it. You remove the barrier, the gas fills all available space. Apparently, our world exists differently, however. The two differing air pressure systems existing next to each other without a physical barrier defies two natural laws. The first is the second law of thermodynamics, which states that high pressure immediately and often violently flows to low air pressure, filling the container. This means that the air on Earth could never exist, like the moon supposedly, because the low pressure of space would never let it form without a container. This leaves many to hypothesize that the Earth is a closed system. 
which allows for this air pressure system that we enjoy to actually exist. And the other law that it breaks is Boyle's gas law. This law states that as you increase the volume of a container, you decrease the pressure within that container. This is illustrated very well by how our lungs work. We don't suck air into our lungs, we create a low pressure inside our chest by using our diaphragm muscle to increase the volume of our lungs, which decreases the air pressure by expanding the container, our lungs, and as Boyle's gas law demands, the, high pressure, uh, the higher air pressure must immediately flow to the low air pressure system, achieving equalization. But there's a pressure gradient, we're told, you know? That's what the defender of the globular earth would state. Well, I would say that pressure gradients can indeed exist in a container. This can be demonstrated by filling an enclosed container with different types of gases, different densities. The heavier, more dense gas will settle the bottom and the lighter one will find its equilibrium near the top of the closed container. This would be strong evidence to suggest that a pressure gradient can indeed exist in a container with a lid and enclosure. In fact, there's a YouTuber by the name of Good Times for All on YouTube. Uh, he, his name is Zachary Zabala. He demonstrated a pressure gradient in as little as a 10 pound tank in a video that he did earlier this year. Imagine if we were able to build a container with a lid many miles high and many miles wide. I would submit to you that if we were able to measure the air pressure at the top of the container compared to the pressure reading at the bottom of the closed container, we would find a significant difference. One that would correlate with our reality. And if we can demonstrate it in a container like Zach's, that small that he did in his demonstration, the evidence that we live in an enclosure of some sort is very strong. What mainstream science is essentially asking us to do is to suspend our understanding of the natural laws that govern our world. When considering how our world was created, how it was formed, we need to just accept that the cosmos is not governed by the natural laws that exist here on Earth. Unthinking respect for authority is the greatest enemy of truth. Mainstream science cannot model or demonstrate their claims, but we can model and demonstrate how the laws of nature work any day of the week. Michu Kaku. Professor of theoretical physics at the City College of New York may have said it best when describing how the mainstream scientific community is faring when it comes to gaining an understanding of our cosmology. This clip from the movie The Principal, and I think really puts an exclamation point on my presentation today. There is a crisis in cosmology. Usually in science, if we're off by a factor of two or a factor of 10, we call that horrible. We say something's wrong with the theory. We're off by a factor of 10. However, in cosmology, we're off by a factor of 10 to the 120. That is one with 120 zeros after it. This is the largest mismatch between theory and experiment in the history of science. 120 zeros. That's the factor that they admit that they're off in understanding our cosmology. I want to thank you very much for your time. Uh, I'm sorry I had to go through the last bit of that a little bit fast. I want to really quickly invite you to listen to my podcast, Dome Life with Paul and Mitch, available on most major platforms. And a big thank thanks to Mitchell, my co-host, because he helped me put this together. And uh, Truth Frequency Radio Show with Roxanne. Roxanne, are you here? There she is. Um, every uh, Wednesday night here in uh, uh, GMT 1 AM. And if you'd like to get in touch with me, my email, paul at paulontheplane.com. I'd love to hear from you. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the convention. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it.